Professor Hans Tewison, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your office in Ohio. You teach human anatomy to medical students, but you are known for your work on the evolution of cetaceans and how their four-footed land mammal ancestors eventually gave rise to the whales we know of today. But before we start, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Did you always have an interest in evolution and, in particular, evolution of whales? Yes, I did always have an interest in evolution and specifically in fossils, how fossils uh, help us understand evolution. The interest in whales came long after I um, worked on evolution. I was a um, master's student in uh, the Netherlands in the University of Utrecht and I moved for a PhD to the United States. Um, for my master's thesis, I was working in Pakistan um, doing field work looking for fossils. And th this question of interest there was how Pakistan and India, the Indian subcontinent, got populated with mammals. Because about 140 million years ago, India, the Indian continent, was attached to Madagascar. It was not attached to Asia. It drifted, it broke off from Madagascar, drifted north, and collided with Asia about 50 million years ago. Oh. So, the way, so after that long period of, of isolation, you wonder how, where the mammals came from that had, in the meantime, evolved in all these other continents. So I was hoping to find mammals that were migrating from Asia into India by looking at fossils from about that age. Um, whales are obviously not very good for that study because they swim. Um, but what happened during that field season that we had in the early 90s is that most of the fossils we found were actually found in marine rock, rocks that were deposited in the ocean, not, uh, not in rivers. So we found bones there, which struck me as sort of odd because that's not at all what I was looking for, but we found all these fossil bones of mammals in these rocks that were clearly seafloor. Um, some turned out to be whales. So as the field season then progressed, I got more and more interested in these animals that were found there. And it's not just whales, it's also relatives of elephants and relatives of uh, autoid ungulates that were aquatic. Um, and so by the end of the field season, we were really focusing on whales. And, and then a year later in 1993, I think it was, we found this amazing complete skeleton that was a real intermediate between the land ancestors of whales and modern whales. Hans, when did we first start to understand the evolution of whales? And where were those first evidences found? Of course, it has been known for a long time that whales are mammals, even Aristotle. Oh knew that whales nursed their young and that some whales had hairs on their faces, uh, which are features only known in mammals. But that was before evolution was thought to have occurred. When Darwin came, came onto the scene, he actually talks about whales in the origin of species. He has this quote um, from, uh, from a Canadian naturalist who, who says that he saw, that this naturalist saw bears in Canada swim in rivers and collect insects to feed on. And of course, that story is not true, but this naturalist did write that. And Darwin writes then in The, Net, in the Origin of Species that, the, um, that that could be a mechanism by which, um, over time, um, whales evolved from these bears that were sifting the water for insects. Uh, Darwin caught a lot of grief for this and because people thought that this was an incredible, silly idea. And he regretted the statement. And as editions of the Origin of Species continue, he made the state, statement shorter and shorter. And by the end of his life, the last edition of the Origin of Species that he uh, worked on, there was no more whales in the Origin of Species. So it was always difficult to understand how that transition what happened. The, the earliest, the, the whale fossils that were around till about the, um, you know, the 1970s, 80s, were all fossils that were animals that looked like modern whales, so that were clearly not able to live um, to live on land. Um, they had mm -hmm. forelimbs that were looked like flippers. They had hind limbs that that were, as far as we knew then, were not existent. And they seem to have had a tail fluke, as you can tell from the vertebral column. So there were really no intermediates known at that mm -hmm. point. Um, only when we started to look in the right places, and the right places were, you know, places like Pakistan and India did uh, my team and several other teams who worked there start to find these intermediates, these whales that um, were transitional, that had the limbs that still could support them on land, were clearly amphibious animals. 
maybe not so surprising to think about it that way. If you think about those animals that are really not very good swimmers and that still that are still closely tied to the land, they wouldn't be able to mm -hmm. cross big oceans. So they originated in this place, the Indian subcontinent, and then never only only moved migrated to other continents after they learned to swim. But by then they look pretty much like uh, like modern whales. Well, over recent decades, more and more finds have been made that span the gap between land creatures and the whales of today. The earliest of these creatures that existed back in the Eocene around 50 million years ago were Indohyus, Pachycetus, and Ambulocetus. Hans, why might these creatures have decided to spend more and more time in the water? And most important, how do we know that they are related to whales? Yeah, two different questions. Um, the first question I would love to have an answer to, and I do not. Um, Indohyus, um, by most definitions, is an ancestor of whales, but does not fit within that order of, of whales, Cetacea, that we talk about. Indohyus was an animal that basically looked like a, a tiny little deer. It's a deer the size of a cat. Um, we know from the chemistry of its teeth, its stable isotopes of its teeth, that it, was a, that it ate on land mostly uh, land, well, on, only land plants. Um, that's also consistent with the shape of its teeth, how the animal was, would be processing its food. Um, we know that it only drank fresh water, not, not um, seawater. Um, however, Endohyus has very dense and heavy bones, and that's unusual. Most land animals have lighter bones because they need to run away and be fast, and the, the heavy bones will slow you down. Mammals that have very heavy bones like that usually spend time, part of their time, in the water. Hippos is a good example of that. Hippos also feed on land. They don't feed in the water, but they spend time in the water for other reasons. For Indohyus, we think that they spend time in the water to get away from predators. And that idea is based on a modern animal called the, the mouse deer, which live in Africa and in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, the, often the French name is used for them. They're called chevrotain in French. Um, and they live close to rivers, eat land plants, but as soon as there's danger, they jump in the water and hide on the water. So we uh -huh. think that that might have been the initial reason for whales, for the ancestors of whales, to go in the water. One step further, beyond in the highest, there is uh, the first whale, which is called Pegasetus. That animal is very different. It's much bigger. It's the size of a maybe a wolf or so. And it is a carnivore, so there the dietary change has taken place, and um, there, and and we don't know what precipitated that that dietary change or what their prey was. This is something that we have been interested in looking at. For that animal too, we know that they only lived in fresh water. The climate was very dry, and um, a lot of um, and the streams that they were in were very ephemeral. Um, so was dry for part of the year, we think that maybe these animals sort of lived like crocodiles do in drinking pools in, in, uh, you know, in Africa or so, where they will try to hunt uh, mammals that come and drink, uh, drink water near the edge of a, of a riverbank. Okay, so then after Pachycetus, the next stage, um, cetacean that we find that around 49 million years ago is Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus is an animal that really looks like a crocodile. Um, much bigger than Pachycetus, um, and clearly a meat eater with a long snout. The other difference is, as I just said, Pachycetus was an animal that lived only in fresh water. Ambulocetus is actually found only in rivers, not in rivers, it's only found in very near shore marine environments. Um, probably close to shore, so where rivers float into the ocean, but every rock type that we found Ambulocetus in has had you know marine snails and marine uh, clams uh, associated with it. So now we are really moving into uh, ocean waters, um, and then the diet seems to be um, they were either uh, catching maybe fish in shallow water, or maybe they were also still hunting some uh, land mammals close to shore. Whales are, of course, mammals. That is, they breathe air, give milk to their young, and have hair if you look very closely at their faces. One way to see whales are related to mammals is to look at their skeletons. The most obvious thing we can see is what appear to be the remnants of hind limbs. Isn't that right?
Yeah, all whales, all modern whales have remnants of hind limbs not sticking out of their body, but just embedded in the wall of the mm. of their abdomen. Um, all whale embryos actually still have tiny little hind limbs that stick out of their body. They have these hind limbs when they're uh, maybe a centimeter or so in size. So very early on in development, and as the embryo grows, the hind limbs disappear. But as like I just like I just said, there are always one or more bones in the abdomen of any modern whale that we have now that that exists now that's that is a remnant of those hind limbs those bones are not functionless um attached to those bones are some muscles that go to the genitals and usually those bones are larger in males than in females because the penis is attached to them but females have those bones uh bones too also in different species of modern whales there might be just a single bone, the pelvis, um, and that's the case, for instance, in dolphins or belugas, mm -hmm. or there might be multiple bones, sometimes even uh, a pelvis and a femur and a tibia. Bones, uh, um, femur is the bone between the thigh and the knee, and the tibia is the bone between the knee and the, and the ankle. Um, so some whales, such as bowhead whales, have all three of those bones, and uh, sperm whales are another example that have really you know a bunch of bones still bones on the left and the right side of their bodies and as i said the, the genitals are attached to those bones so if you think about the role of those bones in modern animals and in, in that they're the anchor basically for some of the genitals um some people have suggested that the hind limbs that we find in extinct whales so some of these extinct whales still had pretty uh, large hind limbs not large enough to support their body weight but still significantly coming sticking out of the size of the body and some people have suggested that those bones were used in copulation as you think about the role of those uh, rudimentary hind limbs in mm -hmm. um, modern whales which are frankly not the rudimentary as hind limbs but they're not rudimentary as structures because the, mm -hmm. the uh, genitals are attached to them that i think has led some people to suggest that the hind limbs that we have in fossil whales have a function in copulation. So some of these fossil whales have long, narrow bodies. Um, they might be uh, 10 or 12 meters long, these animals. And then the hind limbs are, are maybe 30 or 50 centimeters long. So they're clearly not big enough to support the body, uh, but they do stick out of the body wall. Um, and so the question was, what are these, these uh, hind limbs used for? I think people came up with an analogy there involved in copulation based on what we know about sharks um, male mm -hmm. sharks also well both male and female sharks have a long and narrow body but male sharks have these paired organs uh, near their genitals that are called claspers and they're used to position their uh, genitals um, against those of the female during copulation and it was thought here that um, that might be the case for these whales too so it's a it's a reason why there is no evidence beside this analogy for it really um, but that's been that's been proposed. A less obvious piece of skeletal evidence are the ear bones, because cetaceans have a particular kind of ear bone that uh, tells us a lot. Correct? Yeah, the ear is such a fascinating organ. Um, so, for starters, the function of hearing in water is very different from uh, the function of hearing in air, just because the physics of sound transmission in air is very different from the physics of sound transmission in water. So you might expect all kinds of changes in uh, cetacean ears that changes from land mammal, mammal condition. However, I think what you're referring to is a particular structure in the whale ear that's called the involucrum. Um, yep. So if I want to summarize that or, or explain it briefly is basically those ear obstacles that we all heard about in, in grade school, the, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, which transmits sound, are located in a cavity in our head called the middle ear cavity. So that's an air-filled cavity with these three tiny little bones inside them. And that cavity has walls that are made out of bone. One of the bones that makes a cavity in whales is called the tympanic bone. And usually in mammals, that tympanic bone sort of looks like half the shell of a walnut. So it's, a, it's, it's like a bowl-shaped structure um, concave in one side, convex in the other, obviously, it was a pretty, it was a wall, the, the thickness of the wall is, is sort of similar all across. However, in this 
whales are different. Whales do have a tympanic bone, but on one side that tympanic bone is maybe 10 times as thick as in the other side. So it has a thickened lip that's called the involucrum. And that feature, esoteric as it might seem, is actually present in all whales, fossil as well as recent. That's the best feature that unites the, the entire group. So even these very early whales that mm. didn't look anything like a whale, like Pachycetus, you know, looked like a wolf basically, still has an involucrum. So then wrapping back to what, how this might be involved in hearing function, um, mm -hmm. we don't quite know. Um, my hunch is, without this, it's consistent with the data and there's not great evidence for it, is that it has something to do with that transition from hearing in air to hearing in water. And I think the transitional step was that these early whales, and I told you earlier that Pachycetus was a carnivore, um, that they actually listen to low frequency sound by pushing their head into the soil and they would hear the footsteps of potential prey. That sounds pretty weird, it's actually not. That's exactly how, how our crocodiles hear. Crocodiles have their face, you know, in contact with the soil and they hear their prey, not because of the airborne sound, but the first inkling of their prey comes because they hear the footsteps that are transmitted through the substrate that the prey is walking on and the, and the, and the crocodile has its uh, head pushed into. So. That's a reasonable explanation consistent with what Pachycetus might have done. Soil, of course, that these animals were hunting on is similar in den well, it's more much more similar in density to, to water than either of those two tissue, those two substrates are to air. So then it would be a small step to start using a similar mechanism for hearing in water. So I think that that's where that transition came from, that the built of that tympanic bone with the involucrum is involved in hearing through very dense media, either soil or water, uh, because these whales are shifting away from having airborne sound as a very important uh, sound input, um, sound input, yeah. And does that involucrum, is it seen even as far back as the uh, the mouse deer, the uh, Indohias? Yes, Indohias has that too, so it might be uh, that that's, uh, and, and as I said before, that is not a predator. So it might have used that for, for listening to some other waterborne sound that, that I don't know what it is. Maybe I told you before that I thought in Ohio was probably related to the water because it would flee there when mm. it was threatened. So if its predators were, well, presumably they were land predators because if it were aquatic predators, it wouldn't help much to run to the water when you're when you're uh, chased. Um, but it's possible that they would hear their um, predator predators' footsteps while being in the water, and that's how that helped. Um, I will say that for Pachycetus and the later whales, we know quite a bit about the rest of the anatomy of the ear. Um, you know, all the other ones that are that I sort of hinted to before, what they look like and what they're doing. For Indohias, we do not. We have some skulls, um, and we actually just recently CAT scanned them so we can start to look at some of the other anatomy, um, but we haven't done that yet. So frankly, I'm now getting into uh, a bunch of speculation about what Indohias was learning to, but you did ask. <laughs> uh, that's gonna be really interesting to, uh, to see what your, uh, your research shows. As we look along the evolutionary line of whale ancestors, we can actually see how nostrils evolved to become blowholes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's actually really exciting and also really well documented in the following mm. record because, of course, from a skull, you can tell where the nostrils were located, where the nose was located in the bone and flesh animal. So in the earliest whales, Pachycetus, the nostrils are way at the tip of the snout, like they are in most land mammals. Um, for Ambulocetus, we don't have the front of the snout, so we actually don't know where they are. But at about 42 million years, so Pachycetus is about 50 million years old, 42 million years ago, there are still whales around that have their nostrils way at the tip of the snout. However, by then also, some other whales that are about the same age have nostrils that shift back um, that's your back and arm maybe halfway between the tip of the snout and the eyes 
And then by about, um, I don't know, maybe 37 or 35, nine years ago, the, the nostrils shift really on top of the forehead. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a really uh, clear example of a, of a character that, 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 that um, we can see, where well, we can see the evolution happening from the ancestral condition, which was having the nostrils way in the front of the, on the front of the snout, to the having the nostrils on the forehead, which is where nostrils are in all, mod all modern cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So this is the skull of a pig, a modern pig, wild pig. And you see that in this animal, the nose opening is way at the front at the tip of the snout, like it is in land mammals in general. Next to this, this is a skull of a modern dolphin, which is really a small relative of whales. And here you see that the nose opening is way on the forehead of the animal. And that's called the blowhole in whales. And so you see that the blowhole has moved all the way from the front in land mammals to the forehead in dolphins and whales. Then we've got this fossil whale from India. And this whale is called Remitunocetus. And here you see the brain case of the skull. This is the eye, and the nose opening in this whale is way in the front. You see there's a big distance between the eye and the nose is way in the front of this guy. This other fossil whale here, um, for this guy we did not find the brain case, which would have been in the back, but that's the space for the eye. And you see that here the nose opening is further back. It's not way at the tip of the snout here, but it has moved back already towards the eyes. So this intermediate whale, the protoceded, is about halfway between the tip and the eyes. That's right. Amulocetus now is most similar to this whale, um, and that's why we reconstructed an amulocetus in nose opening in this particular spot. It's, so, it's interesting to think about why that happened. There's plenty of other mm. marine mammals that, do, that are perfectly adapted to living in water that actually don't have the nostrils on their forehead. So examples are manatees or seals and sea lions. Yeah. Those actually have their nostrils way in the front. So it's a little too easy to say that that must be an aquatic adaptation. There's probably some other stuff uh, going on there. Um, it sounds I, like it, a mutation or something perhaps that, that just worked out. Yeah, it could be that. Um, in toothed whales, so there's two modern groups of whales, toothed whales and baleen whales. In toothed whales, the nostrils, in addition to breathing, actually also have one other very important function, and that, that function is echolocation. So um, the way oh, yes. you and I make sounds, well, all mammals, most mammals make sounds, is through their larynx, which sits in their throat. Um, but those mm -hmm. don't do that. They make sounds by means of this organ in the front, um, uh, you know, basically above their snout, between their eyes and their snout on top. And this is why dolphins have such a convex forehead. Inside that convex forehead is actually this organ that um, that makes sounds, and that's what dolphins use to echolocate. Okay, so, so they make sounds um, with the side pockets of the nasal cavity, which are located in the forehead. Those sounds then go out through the forehead into the water, and then they listen to reflections of those sounds um, with their ears, and that is um, how echolocation works. Now. That's true. So that would make a good ex explanation for having the nostrils so far back in toothed whales, except that the other group of whales, uh, baleen whales, also has their nostrils way far back on the head, and they do not echolocate. They do not have those organs. Um, so I don't know what to do with this. Maybe some people have suggested that baleen was actually had ancestors that were echolocating and that they've secondarily lost it. Um, so that could be an explanation. I. I, mean, I, don't, I don't really want to speculate any further on that, but that's an, another area of, of active research that's going to be really interesting um, in the next uh, decade or so. Yeah, there's so much that you can continue to study. I mean, uh, there's so much we don't yet know. So it's quite fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Recently, you were in Alaska doing research on modern whales, and I believe that also involved embryology. So how does embryology help us in our understanding of the evolution of whales? All embryos of mammals start as one cell that looks from one animal to the next pretty similar, and then they have to change to be this animal that whatever that looks like whatever it's going to be. But they all go through stages where 
they are, where the embryo of one animal you cannot tell apart from the embryo of a different animal. A bat looks like a whale very early on in development. Um, so that's actually a place where you can see where the sort of the generalized mammal features occur. I mentioned already that hind limbs are present in these early whales. We also talked about the location of the, the nose opening, the nares, in, uh, with, with fossil evidence. Well, actually, the same is happening in embryology. In the earliest embryos of a whale, uh, you know, a few weeks after conception, those uh, nostrils are located way in the front of, of the snout. And then as development proceeds, you can see those embryos, th those uh, nostrils slide back on the head of the dolphin towards the forehead. So in a way, that, that feature uh, mimics, in, in that feature, the embryology mimics uh, the evolution of the animal. I already mentioned that that um, the hind limbs are present in these early embryos. Those go away mm -hmm. too. Another example is the tail. The tail in these early embryos, you know, looks like a, a rat tail. It's a circular cross section and, and long. And then as a dolphin embryo develops, the tail will, will shorten and will develop these side um, uh, projections that are, that then will become eventually this triangular fluke. So those are three characters that are where the earliest embryos look like um, look like the look like the ancestral condition, but then they change into the derived condition that's found in modern cetaceans. This is such an amazing subject, and we've really only covered a small part of it. Your work has really added to our knowledge of how whales came to be and how evolution works. Now, if people want to read in depth on the subject, you authored the book, The Walking Whales, which I highly recommend. <laughs> uh, links to that on your website are in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you so much for coming on to the show. And hopefully we can do a follow up interview one day soon and cover even more ground. That's great. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.